Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Um, whether you are joining us here in the space today, or if you are watching this live stream, or inshallah, you'll be watching in the future. Uh, so welcome to the uh, third part of our series on uh, human dignity uh, by, uh, by Muslim space. And today's topic is really, really uh, crucial. It's something that's very relevant, especially with what all is going on in the world today. Uh, and we are really honored to have uh, Dr. Kamila Mutmin Rashad joining us uh, to talk about white supremacy, racism, spirituality, and dignity. And as I mentioned, this is part of the Human Dignity series here at Muslim Space. And the goal of this series is to elevate and uh, to not just elevate, but elevate the notion that all uh, creation has been granted dignity from the divine. And it is incumbent on all believers to uphold this dignity, not only to ourselves, but to others. Uh, the past two uh, series that we've done or the halaqas that we've done have covered topics such as uh, gender-based oppression. And last week we had uh, uh, anti-racism and Islam with uh, Dr. Bilal Ansari. And we're, we're continuing in, 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 in this trajectory here and talking, tackling a really crucial topic, as I mentioned, in white supremacy, racism, spirituality, and dignity. And so, as I mentioned, our guest uh, speaker today is Dr. Kamila Mokmin Rashad. Uh, so just a quick bio for her, and I'll let her uh, uh, let her take it away from there. But Dr. Kamila is the founder and president of the Muslim Wellness Foundation, MWF, and the, co and the founding co-director of the National Black Muslim COVID Coalition, an initiative launched in collaboration with the uh, with anti uh, with Muslim anti racism collaborative to address the need for effective planning preparedness and organizing during the COVID nineteen pandemic. Dr. Rashad, who previously served as University of Pennsylvania's Muslim chaplain, now serves as the fellow for spirituality wellness and social justice and advises the Black Muslim Students Organization. Dr. Rashad's clinical and research areas of interest include diversity, religious identity, and multicultural issues in counseling, healing justice, and faith-based activism, racial trauma and healing, uh, identity and emerging adulthood, psychological impact of anti-Muslim bigotry and anti-Blackness, and Black Muslim intersectional invisibility. Dr. Rashad has degrees from the University of Pennsylvania, the International Institute for Restorative Practices, and earned her doctorate in clinical psychology at Chestnut Hill College in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. So without further ado, I'd really like to have Dr. Rashad take it over from here and inshallah we'll, we'll, we'll go from there. But Dr. Rashad, please, the mic is yours and the space is yours. Uh. Alhamdulillah, thank you for inviting me. Um, that's, that's quite a lot to read from that bio. Um, but what I would like for, if there's anything that you take away from my background, um, is that I am very much interested and committed to, within the Muslim community, us being able to leverage our diversity um, in all the ways that it shows up so that we can actually be a model for other communities um, and how do we wrestle with these really challenging and important issues and how do we also use our faith as, as an anchor, as a guide, as um, a way to ground ourselves and orient ourselves to the best way to bring our whole selves to these conversations. Um, this is a pretty, um, pretty big topic, um, you know, thinking about um, white supremacy and of racism, of spirituality and dignity. Um, and, and so I think it's that it's important for us as we begin this conversation um, to be very kind to ourselves, to pay attention to what comes up, right? As I go through my presentation, I have a few slides that I want to share, some questions that I'm going to ask. But what I want you to also jot down, right? And literally, if you have a pen and paper or on your phone, type a few notes to yourself, what you begin to feel, right? As I explain some definitions, as I show some images, what comes up? How attuned are you to those emotions, those thoughts, those feelings, um, and how your body feels, right? These things can be very uncomfortable to talk about, but they're so incredibly necessary. And it's, it's, you know, it's, it's like anything working out and developing a habit, right? Um, that when you are able to be fully invested in humility and curiosity um, in just the position that 
I will inevitably make mistakes because I'm human and I am open to being corrected. I am open to um, learning more about myself and others. It makes this process that much easier. Um, and so, you know, as, as Muslims, we're encouraged, right? Everything about our faith is to encourage us to reflect, especially during this beautiful month of Ramadan, um, to think about how can I develop, right? This authentic and strong connection to the creator. And part of that answer is how do I develop a sincere connection to God's creation? Right? And in order to develop that sincere connection to God's creation, it is to know what is our obligation? What do we need to know of ourselves? And then how do we begin to really wrestle with those things that are challenging and problematic and difficult and sensitive so that we can be with one another as believers in our common pursuit of Allah's mercy, right? of Allah's grace, of Allah's forgiveness, when we can do that, I, you know what I say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us everything that we need, right? It is up to us to figure out, right? Almost like a Rubik's cube. How do we figure out this, the best configuration for us to reach a point of alignment, of connection, of understanding, right? And so we, we can't sort of say, well, I don't know. I'm not sure. Allah has already given us everything we need. Right. And so, you know, inshallah, what I'm able to to offer over the course of this hour um, and leaving room for us to have a conversation um, is some more tools for us to begin to figure out how we build connection, how we deepen understanding, how we begin to challenge one another, um, again, in pursuit of um really the, the, the grace and, and mercy and the forgiveness and the kindness of, of the most high. Um, part of that obligation that we have to one another is to, right, to, to pull each other up when we fall short. Um, it is to bring to our attention and our awareness those things that may be displeasing to the creator. Um, and so when we aren't honest about the challenges that we face in the community, that denial creates barriers, it creates disconnection, it, it serves as obstacles to us being the best possible, right, of, of the best nation um, that we can be as Muslims. Um, and so we, we wanna begin to break down some of those obstacles, some of those, those barriers and those challenges um, so that we can prove to be um, a, a model of a community Right, emulating that the community of, of Prophet Muhammad, may peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. Um, and so challenging white supremacy, challenging racism is one way that we begin to demonstrate our obligation to one another, but also to uphold the, the, the dignity and the humanity of God's creation. So with, with that, I wanna begin um, with my slides, but I first wanna show a clip. Um, so many of you may have seen um, either uh, President Biden's address to Congress, and then there was a response from uh, Republican Senator Tim Scott from South Carolina. And I want to play the clip that's sort of gotten the most traction and response um, from, at least from what I've seen in, in my timeline. So if you're just bear with me, I am going to... Um, share my screen so we can see that. It's one thing if I, if I tell you what he said um, and, and quite another for you to kind of hear it in your own words um, and, and think about what are the implications of what he's saying. Um, so I'm gonna pause that there and... Okay, and I'm, I'm hoping... Okay. Okay. Um, Good evening. I'm, I'm going to share that. Scott from the great state of South Carolina. We just heard President Biden's first address to Congress. Our president seems like a good man. His speech is full of good words. But President Biden promised you a specific kind of leadership. He promised to unite a nation, to lower the temperature, to govern for all Americans, no matter how we voted. This was the pitch. You just heard it again. But our nation is starving for more than empty platitudes. We need policies and progress that brings us 
closer together. But three months in, the actions of the president and his party are pulling us further and further apart. A hundred years ago, kids in classrooms were taught the color of their skin was their most important characteristic. And if they looked a certain way, they were inferior. Today, kids are being taught that the color of their skin defines them again. And if they look a certain way, they're an oppressor. In colleges, corporations, to our culture, people are making money and gaining power by pretending we haven't made any progress at all. By doubling down on the division, we've worked so hard to keep. You know this stuff, y'all. Hear me clearly. America is not a racist country. It's backwards to fight discrimination with different types of discrimination. And it's wrong to try to use our painful past to dishonestly shut down debates in the past. I'm so I wanted to stop it there. <laughs> um, there's a, a lot that I have to say about that clip. Um, and before I do, I want you to write down, again, jot it down to yourself, make a note on your phone. What did you think? What did you feel as you listened to what he said? Right, this is Senator uh, uh, Tim Scott, uh, uh, Republican Senator, South Carolina. Um, and he's an African-American man. And he said, hear me clearly, America is not a racist country. It is backwards to sort of fight discrimination with other kinds of discrimination, that children are being taught that if they look a certain way, they're an oppressor. So I, I just want you to jot down, just maybe not even a sentence, but words that come to mind as you listen, right, as you reflect on what he said. So I'm going to pause. OK, so I do have thoughts about what he said. <laughs> um, and I'm going to share my thoughts with you. And I thought, you know, that was just a couple of days ago. Um, and this is in response to, I, I think perhaps this is one of the first or few times that I've heard um, President Biden, you know, say white supremacy is terrorism, um, that he named that specifically. And this is also just a few, maybe a week, maybe not even two weeks yet, um, following the, the guilty verdict in the Derek Chauvin trial, found guilty on all counts of the murder of George Floyd. So when Tim Scott said America is not a racist country, I want us to think about one, what he's saying, what he's implying, what he's denying, um, and why these things are problematic. And, and in particular, also in the Muslim community, right? How do we confront the presence of white supremacy, of anti-Black racism, of discrimination? Um, and what does our faith have to teach us about how to do that well? So again, I'm going to begin. Okay, um, so when we think about, right, and, and these images are so powerful, um, and the reason that I try to incorporate as many images in, you know, what I'm sharing and what I'm teaching is because these things hit us on a subconscious level, on a level that we don't realize, and these are often the images, the messages, the, the sounds that we internalize, right? So what did, I, I don't how, know how many of you may recall, but what did it feel like, right? To watch on the news perhaps, or just recurring loops, watch the Capitol riots happen, right? Capitol riots, Capitol insurrection, um, this, you know, hundreds of white supremacists that converged on the Capitol, caused significant damage, caused death, right? And to see this Confederate flag, right? in that building, right? Against the backdrop of, of that, that painting, right? Um, and so when someone asks, is America a racist country? Or says, America is not a racist country. I think we're asking the wrong question, right? We're, we're sort of speaking to the wrong issue. Um, and, and I want us to, to unpack that. 
so before I submit my answer to this question, I want you to write down your answer, right? Is America a racist country? What does that even mean? What are you being asked, right? And where do you feel yourself maybe feeling confused, conflicted, angry, right? What is coming up as that question is posed? So I'm gonna give you about 60 seconds to just jot down some of the things that you, that you feel or think when that question is asked. Okay. So I wanna begin in a place maybe that's a little unexpected, right? I wanna talk about environmental toxins, right? We have a pretty, even if you're not um, someone that studies the environment, you're not a biologist, you're not a chemist, um, you're not an ecologist, we tend to have a pretty good understanding of what toxins are, right? And when we think about what does it mean if there's pollen in the air, right? Not a toxin, but it's, it causes some difficulty breathing for some people. May have ongoing fires, not just in California, but a lot of different places, produces smoke, right? Difficulty in being able to, to see, right? It impedes visibility. We tend to agree that when we know those toxins are in the air, in the water, in the ground, it can poison us, it can be very detrimental to our health, right? And it typically looks like this, right? If you saw this image, you'd say, oh, yes, that's toxic, right? Those are pollutants that are going in the air um, and it can have a really detrimental impact, right? Or it might look like this, very clear, very evident, right? And what I want us to sort of use in that example is that when those environmental toxins are in the air, right? Difficulty breathing impacts your health in a really negative way. There's some understanding or at least agreed upon um, definitions for what that, that toxicity does, okay? So I want us to keep that analogy in mind. So when we think about social toxicity in Black America, right? Social toxicity, right? refers to the extent to which the environment, the social environment, right, in which a person is, is, is born, being raised, is living, um, is really detrimental to one's health, right? Identity, well-being, right? Not just of yourself as a person, but your family, your community, the places, your neighborhood. It has an impact. And so for, uh, for African-Americans, for Black America, these social toxins look like this, right? And this is just six examples, right? Kind of overarching examples. White supremacy and capitalism, incarceration, detention, monitoring, surveillance, anti-Muslim bigotry and violence, anti-Black racism, right? In, in larger American society, but also within faith communities, racial trauma and violence, right? And that trauma can be historical, intergenerational, um, it's called race-based traumatic stress, right? It's how one feels when you become hypervigilant to the possibility of, of violence and of harm simply because of the way you look, right? Because of those histories of colonization, of genocide, of enslavement, and then all of the subsequent laws and systems that are put in place to maintain these unequal systems, right? That you can internalize, that we do internalize, and it has an impact on our bodies as well. This also looks like, and I don't wanna leave this out because a lot of the imagery from the Capitol riots contain Christian symbols, right? People holding the Bible saying that this is a Christian country. So Christian hegemony refers to, again, a larger system um, that makes Christianity the norm and non-Christian sort of a deviation from the norm right, as somehow not as good or inferior, and therefore subject to discrimination, to targeting, and also to violence, right? We saw that just two weeks ago, or less than two weeks ago, 
um, in Indianapolis with the murders that impacted um, the Sikh American community in that area. We saw it in Atlanta where um, Asian American women were targeted. We've, we saw the Derek Chauvin trial unfold. So when we begin to think about the cumulative impact of the social toxins, it can become very exhausting, very draining, um, and also just, again, very detrimental to the health of an individual and a community. Now we're gonna add on to all of that, a global pandemic, right? And we've seen within the, both in, in the exposure, the infection rate, the rate of death um, because of COVID, and now even the disparities in, in vaccination, that race and racism definitely plays a role. Right. So again, I want to show you some images. These aren't sort of exhaustive, right? But thinking about um, how COVID-19 has really in some ways exposed existing disparities and intensified them or exacerbated them such that you have something like over 60,000 Black Americans that have died of COVID-19, right? Extremely disproportionate given the percentage, right, of Black or African Americans in this country. It is tragic and outrageous to find that these rates are um, so high. And then we have what's called, and this was actually a headline at the New York Times, a pandemic within a pandemic. And these headlines look like this, right? Combining coronavirus and police brutality in Black communities that when police kill black people, the whole community suffers. Experts offer coping strategies, and this is an era of peril for black mental health. So when someone says, is America a racist country? They're asking the wrong question, right? It is assuming that the history of genocide of Native Americans and the continued decimation of, of Native land and Native culture didn't happen. It assumes that the enslavement of millions of Africans over hundreds of years didn't have an effect. It assumes that the subjugation of even religious minorities in this country didn't have a current and prolonged effect, right? So when we ask sort of, those are kind of like gotcha questions, right? Is America a racist country? Well, our vice president said no. Our president said no, but I think they're answering the wrong question, right? The question that we, we have to ask ourselves is because this nation was founded on these, what some have called these original sins, right? Of native genocide, of enslavement of African people, how do we not address what the long-term impact of those sins are, right? in our current day, because they present themselves every single day. And when we think about how we have internalized these messages of, of white being normal and preferred, of Christian being normal and preferred, of that there are certain privileges or assumptions of inferiority of non-white people, otherwise right, known as the global majority, this also has an impact, right? So we have to begin to ask the right questions if we wanna be able to begin to think about the solutions, both that the broader society has to face and also that our faith can provide us as well. So I wanted to offer some important definitions, right? Because it's important, how do we begin to talk about what we're facing, right? If we haven't diagnosed it properly, right? So I said, you know, is America a racist country that's that's probably, it's almost an irrelevant question because the evidence that presents itself every day provides an answer, right? So when we begin to think about these questions and also how we talk about this issue, we need to make sure that we're all on the same page, right? I'll give you an example. How would you feel if you went to the doctor, right? Or maybe now you had a telehealth appointment and the doctor didn't ask you about your symptoms. They didn't ask you how you were feeling. They just said, you know, I don't really think there's a problem, right? You're probably not sick. 
So these things that you're experiencing and you're feeling, it must have be have to do some, with something else entirely. Well, how do you expect a doctor to diagnose a problem if they haven't sort of done a thorough analysis, haven't asked questions, haven't reflected, haven't maybe even had a consultation with another doctor if it's a more difficult or complicated issue. So as, as Muslims, again, that are taught to, to reflect, to ponder, to ask questions, we want to make sure that we're using the right language and that we're engaged in um, a, a process of self-evaluation that is predicated on having as much knowledge and information as we can. So I want to start with these definitions. White supremacy. We hear it all the time in the news. And I, and I think that although on the one hand, I'm really grateful to see that more people are using it. Right? I think just a few years ago, if you said white supremacy, it's like, oh, you're just, you're an extremist, you're a conspiracy theorist, like you're, you're radical, right? And I find that more people are using it. And on the other hand, it's beginning to sort of dilute the definition because there isn't a fundamental understanding of exactly what it means. Um, so this is the idea or ideology that white people and the ideas, thoughts, beliefs, and actions of white people are superior to people of color and their ideas, thoughts, beliefs, and actions. And it's not just an idea, right? It's a political, socioeconomic system where white people enjoy structural advantages and rights that other racial and ethnic groups do not, both at a collective and in individual level, right? So it's an idea that then gives birth to systems, right? There, there were intentional sort of thought projects that emerged out of slavery, right? Out of US slavery, American slavery, in order to justify, right? The dehumanization of an entire people, right? So there were politics, right? And social laws and economic system built on the exploitation of the labor of enslaved Africans. So this is a system, right? It's not simply about how I treat you or whether or not you're nice to me or whether you call me a slur, right? This is a system. And I think that's really, really important to keep in mind. So white privilege, right? Again, a word that's used very often, but not often well understood. And that this is the unquestioned and unearned set of advantages, entitlements, benefits, and choices bestowed on people solely because they are white. Right? And so here are some, some examples um, that with this privilege, right, it doesn't mean that you haven't struggled. It doesn't mean that you haven't had a difficult light, life right, as an individual white person. It means that there are still advantages that you have access to just because you're white, not by virtue of anything else. Right? And it's important to acknowledge those things. Um, this was taken from, um, there's a really great book called Oppression in the Body, Roots, Resistance, and Resolutions. And this chapter was written by an African-American woman. I um, mean, she was describing just what it means to sort of exist with those identities in the world in which conformity, right, to whiteness or the expectation of being able to at least sort of aspire to or come close to what is seen as normal, which is white, what impact that has on the body. So she says, this form of white supremacy demands that if I'm allowed in white spaces, I must communicate in white styles on white terms. I must simulate white bodies and not explicitly communicate that I'm doing so. In this tectonic pressure, I'm reminded every day, my livelihood and my life may depend on simulating well. So what this means is for some, how do you code switch, right? How do you speak in a certain way so that you can remove any semblance or, or any detection of an accent, right? So speaking, right, in quote unquote white ways or in white tones, um, and sometimes that is used to, um, to assimilate, but also to exist, right, within a system that is really not designed for you to be your whole self. It looks like how we dress, right, for black women, whether she wears her, her hair naturally or straightened, right? Natural hair, there's been a lot in the news. 
um, about that as well. Um, but this idea that if you wear your hair the way it grows out of your scalp, it's inappropriate, it's messy, it's unkempt, right? That stems from white supremacy. That stems from anti-Blackness, right? Where else would, would someone be <laughs> expected to change the way that their hair is growing out of their head, right? Because it doesn't conform to certain uh, uh, expectations of the norm of whiteness, okay? Um, so I'm gonna continue with some more definitions. So this is, this is again, um, in, in aspect of racism that we don't pay enough attention to, right? So we tend to focus here, right, on the interpersonal. Racist acts, microaggressions, slurs, the way that one person might treat another, that is just one aspect of it, right? But it's also what is internalized, right? The way you begin to feel about yourself because of the way that you're treated, because the systems in place that are, that are designed to keep you subordinate, okay? It's also structural, so that there are multiple institutions that are invested in upholding, again, that white is normal, white is um, appropriate, right, is superior, right? There are systems that are invested and designed to uphold that ideology of white supremacy. And then finally, institutional, right? So the policies and the practices that reinforce those standards within a workplace or, or organization or community. Um, and so when we only focus on the interpersonal, we miss those other aspects. So again, asking the question, is America a racist country? is the wrong question to ask. Um, so I wanna offer also this, this definition of anti-Black racism. Um, again, it's used, right? But we don't always know whether or not the speaker or the listener has the same definition. So anti-Blackness as being a two-part formation that both voids Blackness of its value, right? So uh, uh, devalues, right? The inherent worth and dignity and humanity of, of black people, and then systematically marginalizes black people and their issues, right? So it says there's, there's nothing of worth, right? In blackness and, and in black people, and those issues that are raised will be systematically marginalized. Um, it is also a covert structural and systemic racism that predetermines the socioeconomic status of blacks in this country. And the structure is held in place by policies, institutions, and ideologies, right? This, this system is not simply held in place by a slur. It's not simply held in place by what you call me or how you treat me, but by policies and institutions and ideologies, okay? Um, another, one of the last few definitions I wanna offer um, is oppression, right? Again, how many of you just, I can't see you on the screen because I'm also looking at the slides, but I want you to think about how often in one day you might hear anti-Blackness, racism, white supremacy, white privilege, oppression. How many times a day do you hear it, right? And do you always understand what is being conveyed by the use of those words? Right? That's something that I want each person to ask themselves, right? What do we understand? Or does it just become sort of a buzzword? Right, something that 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 sounds or feels provocative, but the depth of understanding is not there. Okay, so with this definition of, of oppression is the systematic subjugation of one social group, right, by a more powerful group, and exists within these four conditions. Right, power is always involved. Right, it may not be again. It's sort of going to be invisible. Right, like the toxins in the air that you can't see but it's there, right? And it exerts a tremendous influence, right? It's also internalizing negative messages, which leads to cooperating with the oppressor, right? So I'm gonna go out on the limb here and say that um, uh, Representative uh, Senator Tim Scott has internalized certain messages as well, right? Because if you listen to the, the entirety of his speech, he says, oh, I've been discriminated against. I've been followed in stores. I've been pulled over by police, but I don't live in a racist country. Well, I don't know how he reconciles the two, right? These are not just the acts of individual people, 
but again, within a system, within institutions that are fueled by an ideology, right? A white supremacy, white superiority. Um, and so the last part of this is of oppression is that there are um, clear examples, right? Of genocide, of discrimination, of harassment and they're institutionalized. And when they're institutionalized, again, it becomes invisible. Well, this is just how things are, becomes the conclusion, right? And so members of both the oppressor and the target groups, right, or the oppressed groups are socialized to play certain roles. So this is gonna be really important to understand this, okay? So how does it operate? How does this work, right? And it is to ensure that we don't challenge what is invisible, right? So that we're kind of compelled to forget or pretend that these things aren't happening, right? And that sort of leads to the internalization or even sometimes the belief of a lie, which is, no, there's, there's isn't a system that's impacting me. I just have to work harder. I just have to do better. You know, maybe if I'm pulled over by police, I was just pulled over because I was speeding. It had nothing to do with anything else. I wasn't profiled, right? These are the lies that people begin to tell themselves. And then that leads to um, almost like a, a, a disconnection from the feeling of that marginalization, right? And the loss of voice, right? The loss of the ability to challenge it. And then it makes the power, right? That is one of those conditions to sustain it, it makes it invisible, right? So now as, as a person of color, right? As myself, uh, a, a black Muslim woman, right? A descendant of enslaved people in, in the Caribbean and also in the US, if I'm internalizing these messages about inferiority, about you know, also being a religious minority, right? That there's something wrong, quote unquote, with my faith, right? Because it's not Christian. When those messages are repeated over and over again, and also embedded in institutions, we begin to internalize it, right? So again, as Muslims, part of our duty to ourselves, to know ourselves so that we can know the creator, is to unlearn, right? Is to challenge all of those things that we internalize because they go against what we are taught about ourselves, right? As Muslims, right? That we were not born or created inferior to any other creation, right? That Allah has bestowed on us, right? Certain abilities, even to decide not to believe in the creator. Right? There's no compulsion in religion, right? And so this is sort of the, the gift that we have been given. And still Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says like, well, <laughs> this is what you should do or what you must do or that you can decide to do, right? If this is what you want your afterlife to be, right? And so even within that, if the creator, if the Lord of all of the worlds is giving us a choice, right? Is saying, I'm just going to present the information that is needed, right? And it should be clear what the choice should be, but there's no compulsion, right? Then what do we do when we're living in a system that forces us to begin to internalize lies of inferiority, that power is invisible, right? That there, there are no choices to be made, right? This, this contradicts, right, our faith. This contradicts what we know to be true. So we have to challenge it. So what all of that produces, right? And, and again, I hope you're bearing with me because these definitions are really, really important for us to stand, understand what we're, what we're dealing with. The cumulative effect of racism on a person's physical and mental health is also known as race-based traumatic stress, right? And it, it, it sounds like, or it feels like at times, and many of you may have experienced this, um, maybe not so recently because of the pandemic, but if remember the last time you flew, right? If you are in any way visibly Muslim or person of color, right? Or, you know, your name sounds a certain way. What have your experiences been just going to an airport and getting on a flight? I can tell you that when I fly, I'm thinking about, well, will my bag be checked and double checked? 
will it be open and I'll get, you know, this little love note in my suitcase <laughs> once I get it out of baggage claim that says we've opened it. Will someone stop me or ask another question or kind of give me a second glance, right? All of that you feel, I feel in my body, right? So I don't feel rested and relaxed when I'm going to the airport, right? I feel like a little on edge, slightly uneasy, just hoping that I can just go through security and get on my flight and, you know, alhamdulillah, I can get to my destination. But over time, because of different experiences, right? Even if I'm not consciously aware of the anxiety, it's, it's definitely present in my body, okay? And so historical intergenerational trauma is also um, present when you're thinking about the wounding that happens, right? Through genocide, colonization, enslavement, the transatlantic slave trade, it's also as a result of war, which has displaced a lot of people. Um, and so all of those things are still, again, having an influence on how you might feel in your own body. So if all of that is true, right, that is a system, white supremacy is a system, it's an ideology, it's um, influenced social and political institutions, what is the impact of that? So I wanted to just share something I, I, I tweeted back last November. And, and, and it generated some discussion, which, which I'm happy it did. Um, but, I, but I think that, or at least what I'm encouraging we do, is to begin to focus on the impact of whiteness and white supremacy and see anti-Black racism, to see anti-Blackness, right? To see the discrimination that even we find within our faith community as a symptom of white supremacy, right? It's not it's sort of a, a fruit from the tree, Right? It's not the root. The root of it is white supremacy. So when races, racism is discussed within American Muslim communities, there's a tendency to assign Black Muslims the role of identified patient. Right? So it sounds like, well, we have to stand in solidarity with our Black brothers and sisters, which is a great thing to do. Right? But I think we have to sort of like poke a little bit at what is the underlying sort of impetus right, or intention behind it. So I wanted to break down the term identified patient, right? I'm a clinician, I'm a psychologist, right? And so I'm familiar with this term identified patient, but I wanted to explain it. So this is a clinical term often heard in family therapy, and it describes one family member in a dysfunctional family who expresses the family's authentic inner conflicts, right? So it's sort of, in, in, in sort of a, in a nutshell, the quote unquote problem child, right? That child or that person sort of, um, embodies or is projected onto all of the conflicts, all of the dysfunction, well, it has to be about that person, right? And if we fix that person, or if, if that is addressed, the family is great, right? We have no other problems outside of this, but that is usually not the case. So as a family systems dynamic, the overt symptoms of identified patient draw attention away from the elephants in the living room no one can talk about, which need to be discussed. The identified patient is kind of a diversion, right? Kind of a scapegoat. So what I'm suggesting is that Black Muslims become, in this sort of identified patient way, the diversion and the scapegoat in, these, in the challenge, right, to anti-Blackness in these conversations, right? And it becomes very superficial. It becomes very trite and avoidant. We don't want to do this basic analysis anymore, right? Of course, right, as believers, we should be standing with one another, right? Not simply in terms times of crisis or in, in, in violence, but this is our way, right? This is what we're taught. And so let's not sort of use this diversion and the scapegoating and challenge white supremacy, right? So the elephants in the room include internalized white supremacy, whiteness, right? Aspirational and otherwise. And by that, I, it means if someone were to ask you whether or not, again, the Tim Scott question, um, and you said, well, you know, nothing has ever happened to me. I've been fine. I haven't ever been discriminated against. So I guess that means racism doesn't exist or perhaps not to the degree that black people are protesting, right? And I sort of see that as if someone asks you for, I'm using a very, sort of um, benign example here. 
if someone said, you know what, give me a restaurant recommendation. I'm so hungry. I can't wait for iftar, you know, break my fast. Give me your best possible recommendation for what I should eat for dinner, right? Where should I go? And someone says, well, before I give you that recommendation, what I'm going to tell you is that restaurant, mm, it's really bad. The service is horrible. And this is what we've known for hundreds of years, right? This is how they treat certain people. This is how um, they sort of try to get around, right? Being um, more uh, uh, customer service oriented, right? It's just, you go to that place and you have a horrible experience, especially when you're black, right? If someone offered you that feedback, sort of that advice, that suggestion, and you said, well, I hear you, but I'm gonna go there anyway because it's got really great reviews and I think that they'll treat me better because I'm not black, right? Or in other words, when you're hearing about the treatment of black people and people of color, right? Those who are being, who have been systematically, right? Systemically, historically marginalized and you say, mm, maybe that's just you or maybe you're reading into it a little bit too much. Maybe that's really not the case. Maybe it's gotten a lot better and you completely disregard the experiences and the historical knowledge of the, those communities of people. That is usually fueled by aspirational whiteness, right? If I get close enough to what is deemed proper and normal, then there are advantages perhaps that I can gain. Right. And in our community, in our faith community, we have to challenge aspirational whiteness as well. Um, and so all of those elephants are present. Right. And you cannot remedy the illness without a proper diagnosis. So anti-black racism is a symptom of the disease, but not the disease itself. So here are the questions that I have, <laughs> not the Tim Scott questions, but do we truly interrogate the ways whiteness and white supremacy is disruptive in Muslim spaces, in our spaces, in our spiritual spaces. Do we interrogate that? How corrosive is it? How, how white folks in the community or adjacent to it are privileged or given deference and latitude which is ex extremely detrimental to all of our well-being, right? So again, what is the pattern? What is the system of behavior that is corrosive to us that stems from white supremacy? That's what I think we have to answer. So I'll answer it for you. <laughs> think about it, but I'll tell you this, based on my experience, my observations, my expertise, we don't talk about this, right? Because everyone is focused on the identified patient and that is black Muslims. So much so that the system of white supremacy remains invisible and folks are actively resistant to exploring beyond those bond spots in order to maintain the status quo, right? And that usually sounds like, well, if, if I'm doing okay, if my family is doing okay, do I really wanna get into conversations around racism and anti-blackness, right? And social justice. Will that in some way jeopardize the, the, what I've earned, right? Individually, right? These are sometimes the questions that actually silence people instead of pushing them to speak up as, as our faith requires. So moving forward, let's shift our focus on understanding whiteness and white supremacy, right? How it functions, the complicity that it requires, the way it corrodes relationships, and how it supports mediocrity, abuse, and violence. We have to challenge this. So the first way that I want us to challenge this <clears throat> is to think about how these notions of Black inferiority, right, which is the flip side, shows up. And I'm using sort of the, the black white binary, but in our community, right, a community that's predominantly people of color, we have a, a full spectrum of, of racial and, and ethnic and linguistic diversity. And in the American context, it is reduced to black and white strategically, right, for a reason. This is why there are efforts often, right, historically to pit Asian communities against black communities, right? Well, if you're Asian, we'll, we'll, this is what you can um, earn or have as an advantage over black community members, right? And so it, it, it pits those who are of the global majority, right? But are considered 
people of color or non-white here in the US context against each other, right? So now white supremacy is invisible, right? Now it becomes about sort of these, these other conflicts, right? That are in fact fueled by white supremacy. So in order to challenge that, right? We have to understand just the function and the role of black stereotypes and tropes, right? And I want you to ask yourself, and I'm gonna pause here just to give everyone an opportunity to reflect. What have I come to believe about blackness and black people, right? I'm not asking you to tell me, I'm not asking you to tell anyone else. I want you to be honest with yourself, right? As a result of spending however long you have in the United States, what have you come to believe about blackness and black people, right? And you can kind of get at that by thinking about, well, what is your response to either witnessing or hearing or observing or being told incidents of discrimination, of violence, right? Of harassment, right? Of, of marginalization. Is there somewhere in the back of your mind you think, well, maybe there's another explanation. Maybe it's not racism. Maybe it's not racist. Maybe there's a different explanation. Right? So I wanna give you 60 seconds to, to think about that question. What have I come to believe? Okay. And I hope you're keeping a running tally of all of these responses, <laughs> okay? All right. So here are my recommendations. Right? Confronting internalized white supremacy can save lives. So thinking about where you are and being able to confront white supremacy, okay? Where are you in this zone of growth, right? I have my own thoughts about the term anti-racist, um, but it's, it's one that I think people are becoming more familiar with. Um, what I would say is instead of becoming anti-racist, right, is it how are you becoming more aware of the context in which you live and how it has impacted you, right? And then what needs to be done to unlearn some of those negative effects, right? So if you're still in sort of this like fear zone, right, I still want to be comfortable. I don't want to rock the boat. I don't really want to ask the hard questions, right? then that means there is still something within you that you are not ready to confront. And there has to be an acknowledgement that the fear around confronting those things has, is an impediment right, in our community, given our level of diversity, given um, just what, what the global UMA looks like, but also the American, right? If there is a, a, an unwillingness to confront racism, to confront white supremacy, then that means that they're at that point, right? The individual who does not want to confront those things is in fact complicit, right? In some way. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want that to sit with me, right? If, if I am called before my creator and I am asked about what I have done, right, how I have behaved, how I have functioned, how I have served in my community. I don't, I, I want to be able to say, right, that I've challenged, right, in the way that we are taught those injustices. But we need to be in this learning, at least in the learning zone, right? What can I discover about myself? What questions can I ask? How can I be vulnerable? How can I listen, right? Because then that can lead to growth. Um, here's, here's also kind of another suggestion um, that when we're thinking about growth it is an acceptance that we will make mistakes, right? Maybe I'll say something that's just didn't quite come out the way that I intended, right? And I'm going to use it as a learning experience, right? I'm going to make mistakes, right? I'm going to take risk. I'm going to do the work that I need to do in order to stay humble in order to be receptive to, to what other people can share with me, okay? So that's 
on, on the courage and the growth side versus being fixed or comfortable. So here's, here's where I want us to, um, to spend some time, right? Um, that we are aware of, um, you know, at least one of my, my favorite hadith um, about, you know, those things that, on what levels do we begin to confront these issues, right? And so how do we begin to do that first? In our hearts, right? I say this begins with introspection and a radical self-awareness. What do I need to know about myself first, right? Yes, I can learn a lot of things about other communities and other marginalized groups. Maybe I'm part of the, um, the oppressed group or a different target group. But I want you to think, what do I need to learn about myself? What have I internalized, right? Because like I said in the beginning, white supremacy is one of those social toxins that is present, but it's invisible and we don't see it often, right? Now, when we saw images of the, the capital attacks, riots, insurrection, for some of us, it was like, well, that's clearly white supremacy, but that was not the unanimous sort of conclusion, right? Some people said, oh, well, maybe they're just really passionate and that's not what I believe. So we have to begin to think, right? What do I need to know about myself first, okay? Because if I don't know myself and what I'm also challenged with or challenged by, then how would I be able to speak and do from a place of good intention and of humility, okay? Um, so perhaps we get to the point where, you know, it's not just sort of this thing that I'm challenging in my heart, but I'm ready to speak about it, right? I'm ready to do something with my tongue. Well, that will require, right, an honest and a vulnerable dialogue. Do you have space or spaces in your life where this honest, vulnerable dialogue can take place, right? Is that something that you have access to, right? Is there a community of people that um, you are able to call on when you say, you know what, something happened and I just wanna check in, right? Um, I want to be able to, to think about my role in certain conversations or the way that I'm perceived or the way that things that I do might have an impact different from what I intend, right? Can you speak to those things? Do you have a space, okay? And then finally, once we're able to understand our intentions and, and do that introspection and that purification of our hearts and have those honest dialogues, right? then what do we do, right? It, 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 is, it is what we, our behavior, right? The actions that we take that people see very readily, right? And so what is the advocacy? What is the commitment to upholding the dignity of God's creation, right? How does that manifest itself, right? And so I wanna uh, just summarize in that, um, you know, if, if, if our beloved prophet taught us, right, that if you see it evil, right, change it with your hand. And if you aren't able to do that, right, then change it with your tongue. And if not able to do that, then with your heart, right? But this is the weakest of faith. So we want to kind of take ourselves on this journey of purification, of honesty, right, and then of action. And this is what our faith gives us, right? It's almost like these, uh, again, all of the tools, the strategies, the formula, right? What will help us be able to get closer to the creator, get closer to his creation, to build a strong and solid community, right? We have the answers that we need. What we need as a community, as individuals, is sort of the courage, the vulnerability, the patience, to use all of these tools that we've been blessed with to confront the issues of our day, right? Because we've all internalized notions of white supremacy, of black inferiority, of 
you know, what is considered good and pure and what is considered bad, inferior and evil, right? Because this is built into the institutions in which we live, right? So this is not about character. This is not, oh, you're a bad person if you've internalized white supremacy. It is, no, just like there are toxins in the air, and if you breathe that air, <laughs> you will inhale some of that, right? So we have to think about white supremacy and anti-Blackness as a toxin in the air that we breathe every day. And so how do we clear our lungs? How do we clear our heart of it, right? What is the antidote? Islam has given us some of these really, really just perfect solutions. Um, and so it is up to us to figure out how we use them to the best of our ability. Um, so I want to stop there because I want to hear from you and I want to see you um, and we can continue to have a conversation about how we use these tools. Thank you so much, Dr. Camila, for that. That was just so thorough, but also so thought provoking, um, you know, for, for I, I don't know about the rest of the folks here, but, you know, as someone who's uh, not not black, but not white, but in in, 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 in the uh, kind of the, the spectrum of the Muslim community that kind of feel is, is in between sometimes is that in that aspirational whiteness and kind of directed on where to go. It, it, it's just such a powerful analogy, especially with the toxins in the air, um, the multi-layered structure to this. It's not just like, hey, uh, if, you're, if you're not racist, you, you know, you're not part of this process, these, these binaries that are there. So I really appreciate you lifting that up. Um, uh, and again, just to everyone here, uh, we, we, uh, are, are taking questions here. So feel free to drop them in the chat. You can message them to me. You can raise your hand and we can call on you. But I've got a couple questions here that, that had come in. So uh, Dr. Sure. Kruger, you're all right. We can go ahead and we can uh, start start swinging with that. Um, yeah. So one question came out um, from someone that says, there's an undeniable trend of women, including Muslim women being more present in confronting racism and white supremacy. How mm -hmm. can we push for communal growth when the bulk of the most energized advocates are relegated to the back of a mosque? Ooh, that is I know, a powerful I felt question. That one. I, was like, I was like, oh boy, that was just coming in. So, so I'm going to ask you to read it to me one more time. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, so just a moment here. So there's an undeniable trend of women, including Muslim women, being more present in confronting racism and white supremacy. How can we push for communal growth when the bulk of the most energized advocates are relegated to the back of the mosque? Hmm. Wow, that is an outstanding question. Um, and so I'll do my best to, um, to offer some, some insight. Um, I, I think this is where, so I'm, I'm speaking specifically here in, in relation to white supremacy around racial privilege, right? And, um, and yes, there, there is a binary and I, and I think that is intentional because then it says like, oh, well, I'm not white or black. So I'm just gonna sit here on the sideline and you know, this doesn't involve me. Um, this doesn't sort of play a role in my life. And it, it absolutely does. Um, and so we have to, to, to speak to that question. I think we have to challenge those areas of privilege that we do have, right? And so there's, there's a way that the ways that 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 white supremacy manifests, say, for Black Muslim women, right, or for South Asian Muslim women, um, still has a lot to do with being objectified and exoticized and vilified. Um, and so, say, as an as an Asian man, as a Black man, um, as as a white man, you know, in the Muslim community, how do we also recognize the ways that sexism, white supremacy? Um, racism are all intertwined, right? And, and, and intertwined in a way to uphold power, right? And so when you see that there's a trend of Muslim women who are on the sort of front lines of confronting this, it's also confronting power. And so when, when we have to do sort of that, that heart work around the purification, the question that we have to ask ourselves is, well, what might I have to lose if I challenge this system? Right. And so if you have just a little bit more privilege within the system, are you willing to give that up? Right. Are you willing to examine it? Are you willing to name it? Um, and so when you see one, I think just historically women have been at the forefront of many 
right, different sort of movements and advocacy. So it isn't new. Um, I think what's new is the visibility, especially of visibly Muslim women, uh, or women of color, um, where there's just more opportunities to see, right, what's happening in the world. Um, so I, I think that when we are taking note of spaces where men are absent from the conversation, I think we need to think about, well, wh what is the power dynamic happening here? Um, where are their sort of models of advocates on behalf of this issue? And how does that person sort of enlist more support, um, enlist more visibility, visibility and advocacy um, on the part of those who have more privilege? Um, so uh, there, there's more that I, that I could say, but I, I wanna make sure we get to the other questions and hands, but um, I think we always have to interrogate where's power and who, who stands to lose the most or will need to risk, right, more in order to, to move the movement forward. Thank you, thank you. And thank you for that, that question. Um, we've got uh, Joe uh, Milburn here, he's got a question. Um, I think he'll ask it over video here. Yes, Salaam Alaikum, Dr. Uh, Rashad. Um, I hope you're doing well. I have a bit of a flu right now, so please bear with me. But one thing that I did appreciate, it's more of a comment, but one thing I did appreciate about your um, <clears throat> talk, and this is something that I've had to do a lot of like self-reflection on as a white convert, is how you brought up aspirational whiteness. Because I've noticed that many uh, from the immigrant Muslim community, that is the immigrants and the Senate, like first generation children of immigrants, I notice always tend to feel some sort of validation when white people convert and not that we're against or should be against white people converting but it's something i've noticed that there's always like this push to like when they have these convert panels they always try to pick the white people to speak to sort of be the face of islam when i and and these are things where it's like even i myself have had to do some internal reflection on so like i don't become a prop to normalize aspirational whiteness because even white converts such as myself could could intentionally or unintentionally fall into this trap if we're not cognizant of what we're of the, of what we're being asked to do or how we're being approached and things like that so i just want to say you know thank you for bringing this these things up absolutely um thank you for for joining the conversation um one thing that i i want to sort of explicitly name and explain um is that the way the discourse in America tends to unfold, it's about character, right? It's, it's about, well, if I have these thoughts that are labeled racist, that means I'm bad, right? And so in order to avoid the bad feeling, I'm just not gonna think about it, right? I'm not going to challenge myself because I'm a good person, right? So this reduces, again, the discussion to the interpersonal, right? Or the intrapersonal, right? I wanna be a good person. I am a good person. This is about my character. Well, no, this is about a system that has been in place for centuries, right? That began with the genocide of an entire peoples and the enslavement of another, right? And so when that is your beginning, <laughs> you're, there are gonna be repercussions, right? For everyone. Um, and so when we think about, you know, I, I've seen a lot of memes that'll say, you know, the worst, what's worse than being a racist is being called one. <laughs> like people just, I mean, they kind of just fall out, like just disintegrate, right? So if you say, well, that was racist or that, that comment or that behavior. So it's, it's being called one and not actually saying, well, what did I do that generated that response, right? Um, I'll, I'll give a quick example. Someone on Twitter, um, it's such an interesting place as a psychologist for me to be. <laughs> um, but someone posted um, a video of, um, I, I don't know if he was African-American, but a, a black man in dreads, I, I think he was wearing a, a kufi, um, but he was um, had beautiful recitation of the Quran. And um, I can't remember exactly what the caption was um, or the quote tweet was, but the implication there was, wow, like 
Black people can recite the Quran like really well, right? I mean, so I'm, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but that was the impression, right? And so, and, and multiple people commented, multiple Black people and said, you know, the underlying assumption here is that this is an anomaly, right? Like, wow, mashallah, this person is like, have you not heard of the centuries of African scholars, of Black scholars of Islam, right? Or just that there are Black people that can also recite, right? Scholar or not. And the defensiveness around that was like, oh, well, you should think better of people. Why would you assume that, that I'm being racist if I say that? And that's where the defensiveness blocks the growth, right? Because the question should have been, wow, I didn't realize that my comment about this video sort of highlighted my own internalized anti-Blackness and I need to take a look at that, right? Instead it was like, oh, prove it, I didn't say that, right? And so now this is where the conversation stalls, right? It's not about someone saying you're a bad person, but that you have inhaled all of the toxins. And so when you speak, <laughs> you inevitably exhale them right back into the atmosphere. So what do you need to do in order to minimize the likelihood that you will do that? Right? You have to learn, you have to unlearn, and you have to challenge yourself and be open to being challenged. Um, so... I just wanted to, to explain that just briefly. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank, thank you, Dr. Rashad and uh, for Joe for, you know, lifting that up, but uh, the, the, that, that, that self-reflection and what, what that looks like, those, those internal, uh, those internal battles and, and speaking, speaking that to, to this space. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you, uh, Dr. Rashad, kind of going in uh, a similar direction there, Joe, Joe had brought up this uh, observation of aspirational whiteness within especially the uh, immigrant um, Muslim community, especially as, you know, as a South Asian uh, Muslim, I can definitely attest to that. I was snapping my fingers when Joe was speaking. I was like, yeah, that's exactly it. So I grew up post 9-11. I saw what was going on. Um, mm -hmm. So my, my question to you here is how often or how, how I'm trying to think, think of how to best phrase this, but this concept of aspirational whiteness has been covered by uh, masked, if you will, by being a good Muslim. It's good, yes. to, like, you know, after 9-11, after especially, I saw this, our rhetoric was when put on the fence, it was that uh, Muslims are peaceful. We're not the terrorists. The, you know, yes. we have these dichotomies. We fall into that instead of asking about imperialism, instead of asking about all these things, uh, we, we bought into that narrative. And for yes. the better part of that decade until things started to change, like, wait, this isn't normal. The, people started to ask those questions and space was given, but for a good part of those uh, those Bush years, it was that, no, we're the peaceful Muslims. We don't do this. Like, let's invite these Republican politicians to tell us why it's good to be a peaceful Muslim and things like that. But yeah. uh, that loyalty to country, these these values that were lofted up were like, this is what a good Muslim is look like. This is what yes. good Muslim values are, but it's coding for that aspirational uh, whiteness. So how, how, how do we, as it's kind of embedded, as it's kind of just so, you know, just meshed together, how do we disentangle those? Oh, I mean, that is, that is another great question. Um, it, it stems or it's related to model minority myth, right? And so once there was an opening, um, the Civil Rights Act and around immigration in 1965, you get an influx, right, of immigrants that are not white. Um, and the, again, the intentional sort of division that is created is to, um, to really begin to push that, well, you see these African-Americans, these black people, well, the reason that they're not successful is because they're lazy and they don't work hard and um, they just, they, they don't have the same kind of work ethic, but you, you've come to America and you've worked hard and you've done your diligence and you've gotten a good education and that, therefore you're successful, right? Um, so it requires an internalization of black inferiority. It requires a denial, right? Of the system of white supremacy, which will always elevate, right? Those who will conform well enough with white ideology, right? So the minute that you begin to challenge it or say, wait, hold on a second, <laughs> I need to read the fine print. <laughs> um, then you'll start to see where there's, there's pushback, 
Um, and so what I, what I also say about sort of this, this tie between model minority myth and aspirational whiteness is also acknowledging, I think the grief that is involved in the process of immigration, right? And so if someone says, you know what, I'm for many reasons, giving up the tie that I now have to my home country, right? I'm going to a very different country um, and, and I have to be invested in it, right? It's like, it's almost like I have to buy into this fantasy. Otherwise the, the dissonance will be too great, right? So would someone willingly say, you know what? I'm gonna make my way to this racist country built on genocide and enslavement <laughs> and I'm gonna try my best, right? I mean, so, so I think there's, there's and, and a lot of this is subconscious, right? There's an investment in a fantasy, right? That people need so that the mourning of the loss of home, right? Is a little bit reduced, right? So it has to be like, no, this has to be a better place than the one that I, or, or it has better opportunities, right? Um, for me and for my children, because I've given up so much, right? In order to be here. So <clears throat> would I knowingly give up so much to be in a place where I'm inhaling toxic white supremacy every day, right? That's, that's really, really difficult for people to sit with. Um, and so there's a buy-in, right? There is um, a desire to want to believe. And, and, and I think this was disrupted around 9-11, right? When people say, well, I, I'm a good one right? Like, why are you pulling me over in the airport? Right? Like, don't call me Muhammad, call me Mo, like, you know me from work. And now you're profiling me like what? Right? And so there was this, this moment of, I think, also mourning again, right? Like, I did not think that I would have to go through this kind of monitoring surveillance. And, and, and we have to remember that after 9-11, there was blanket suspicionless surveillance. There were databases made of people who had Muslim sounding names, right? So, and these were people who went to work, sent their kids off to school, right? Had soccer on Saturday, <laughs> right? And so there was, I think this disillusionment, but also kind of the holding on to, well, no, maybe that's just an isolated incident until you hear about like the decade of NYPD surveillance up and down the East Coast right? Now there's overwhelming evidence that's challenging that fantasy, right? And people may react to that challenge to the fantasy with anger, with denial, um, with sadness, with despair, until they can reach a point to say, well, I can both appreciate the opportunities that I'm offered here and confront the fact, right, that the racism and the discrimination that exists actually fundamentally alters my own humanity, not just the humanity of those who are directly targeted, right? So I'm hoping that as a community, we can begin to shift more towards um, naming, right, the system, because it's not about the individual character, right? Not all, well, I don't wanna reduce it, but it's, it's more of the system that is designed to keep people functioning in a certain way so that it can operate invisibly. And so when you start to see it, it's like kind of waking up to the matrix and you're like, oh my God, my head hurts, right? Like there's like white supremacy everywhere. Yeah, cause it is, <laughs> right? But what we can do in the spaces that we have control over is to, you know, purify it of those toxins as much as possible, right? So that we're better as a community. Thank you. Thank you for, for lifting that up. And this, this connects to this, to this next point um, with regards to those community spaces. Uh, this might connect to the first question that we asked, but for many Muslims, that community space where they get their information, where they, where they get their guidance and instruction comes oftentimes from a mosque setting, oftentimes from a setting that may be from a non-Black perspective, non-Black Muslim perspective. And so uh, it, it may be, you know, uh, embedded within this, uh, this, this, these toxins that are coming out, not, you know, not, 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 not by any ill intent, but just, just as, as a product of it. And so my question to you is uh, now kind of going in towards like the resources towards what is out there. Uh, I want to lift up a, um, uh, a incident that had happened just to give folks an example of last year, 
after um, the murder of George Floyd and all of the uh, protests and, and, and just the, uh, you know, demonstrations and everything, the renewed uh, vigor into our, uh, into our um, conversations about racial injustice, there was a very prominent mosque um, that held in response, held a systemic racism um, conversation and none other, no activist, but was the local police chief. <laughs> There's not a, a, a single person on the panel that was from a, uh, you know, does just from an activist perspective, just someone doing the work of actual systemic racism. I attended yeah. the, the conversation just to see and it wasn't even mentioned once. And it was just like, that's that's within that's within a mosque setting yeah. that's within like you know just these communities where we go and we get our information for people in that community that's their information to it so systemic racism oh hey I, i've got a black police chief that's coming and telling me that we're, we're not racist the police department's here for your safety all that stuff it's problematic on so many levels <laughs> yeah yeah so i mean like they, they definitely got their backlash uh, for it but unfortunately still still held the event um that was there but in in a, in a place like that, you know, you you've uh, founded a uh, an organization. You know, just just so many different resources that are out there for Muslims that might get frustrated with spaces where they have to maybe submit an idea to a board and wait for it weeks and weeks to even manifest. And by that time, it's old news. So where can uh, people go, especially Muslims who are not. Uh, maybe black or are immigrant or kind of wrestling with this, doing a lot of uh, self-reflection, what resources are out there for them to challenge these notions, but also to, uh, to, to change that narrative, to change, yeah. uh, the, to do that reflective heart work that you were talking about? Yeah, I, I think the, the resources <clears throat> are really important to, to help counteract the frustration, right? And, and the, the, sense of disillusionment or discouragement. And so I think Muslim Anti-Racism Collaborative is a really, really great place to start. Um, so muslimart.org. Um, and if you follow, so follow them on Twitter and, and, and Instagram um, and Facebook. And what they've done even for the month of Ramadan is to really tie our uh, reflection and our worship um, towards anti-racist goals. Um, during during this month, um, because again, we're about reflection and um, repentance um, of understanding. Um, and so this this must take place in sort of every aspect of our life. Um, and so Muslim Arc offers, I think, that framework um, for what do I need to know, right? And I think even the creation of spaces where people can feel vulnerable enough to even admit what they don't know, right? And so, so I, I always just say as a baseline, right? Sort of like ground rules is that we've all internalized white supremacy. Every last one of us, including myself, right? They're, to receive these messages repeatedly and in so many ways and in so many levels, you will, right? Um, and so, being able to sort of be armed with the knowledge that there is this internalization just as a baseline um, and that we will make mistakes, right? The difference is who are we in community with, right? That we built relationships with, right? That will lovingly, right? Have conversations with us, talk about sort of mutually beneficial learning, right? Not just like, well, I'm coming to learn from you because you're black, but I also want to, for, for example, learn more about, you know, my great grandparents were immigrants from, from the Caribbean, right? I was born in New York, in Brooklyn, right? And so if I'm talking to someone about, well, what is it like perhaps to even be in, you know, maybe the children of immigrants. And so you're knowledge and awareness of the systemic nature of racism and white supremacy is very different from your parents, right? And so they're like, look, just graduate and do your homework. I don't, what are you talking about? <laughs> I didn't come here for this. <laughs> and they're like, well, it's here and we're here. So we're gonna have to talk about it. Um, but even, even navigating and negotiating um, and dealing with maybe the disappointment Right. If you see the aspirational whiteness manifested in the people you love, right, that is a very difficult conversation to have. So, so I think what, what we have to remember is that you know Muslim Arc has um, really great resources, and what we're developing within Muslim Wellness 
um, are ways to, to talk about the healing aspect of it, right? Like what is painful about this? What is really, really difficult to communicate about when it involves family, it involves loved ones, it involves um, uh, uh, even those that we might respect and hold in high esteem. And they say things that make us cringe, <laughs> right? I'm like, oh my God, you said that out loud. Um, so when we're thinking about this, not as just an individual sort of process, but it's a family and a communal process as well that brings up a lot of emotions. Um, and so what Muslim Wellness is working on developing um, are sort of a, a series of um, workshops that directly address healing from racial trauma. Um, and that racial trauma in occurs in all communities, not just black communities. Um, and so we're hoping that that offering will give people not just sort of the, uh, just the knowledge, but also the, the space, right? To talk about why this is so hurtful and painful and difficult. I appreciate you lifting up those those res the resources that's there through through Muslim art, but also uh, the 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 heart work, the re the the healing work that you're providing to help uh, create that space um, where you know we can be as informed as we can, but at the end of the day, you know, is it really starting to sit into our hearts, or is yes. it just something that we've memorized? And I really appreciate you lifting those two up. Um, so we'll be sure to send that to folks. Um, just wanting to be mindful of time. There's there's just one last thing uh, I'd I'd like to lift up. Uh, just you know, in in the sense for for you, and the, feel free to answer this as as you uh, are comfortable, but, uh, you know, we're entering the, the last 10 days of Ramadan. Um, and, you know, the, 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 this 10th, these last, this last uh, third is kind of marked by seeking a freedom. You know, we, we often say seeking freedom from the fire, but generals, you know, breaking those chains, you know, seeking mm -hmm. freedom, seeking protection and, 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 and ridding ourselves of, of this. Um, as we go into these last 10 days of introspection, of self-reflection, of purification, and really of liberation, yes. How, what, what strategies, um, what really interpersonal exercises um, or sources of healing or things that mm. we can do, any practices that you feel are, uh, are worth to lift up um, that can be go hand in hand with our ibadat when we do worship, when we read the Quran, what, we, what can we do in these last 10 days to make it truly transformative, especially with such a uh, such a you know multi-layered topic and issue and thing that we're all we're all breathing toxins in. Yes. How can we detoxify and put that air purifier on yes. uh, during these last ten days? Change the filters. I mean, <laughs> we have to do it all. Um, so what I would what I would say in response to that question is um, what I what I asked towards like the middle of of my talk is what have I come to believe about myself? Right? What have I come to believe about? who I am racially, ethnically, religiously, um, and to be, to be very honest, right? In that um, kind of self-evaluation, right? Um, and sometimes that looks like um, given, given where you are or, or where you may be, sort of strategies that you've learned over time, um, and, and often out of survival or protection, like to minimize, right? Or to sort of shrink who you are, right? So there are maybe some split spaces where, or where you're driving. Um, I, was, I was in North Carolina not too long ago and I was like, ooh, these are, this is the kind of place where they fly Confederate flags. <laughs> um, and so even noticing like what is happening in my body and how I was so conscious of the fact that I was visibly Muslim, um, you know, and, and thinking like, like I, I'm really anxious right now, right? Um, and so I, I think during this last um, third is to do that kind of honest and, and courageous like self inventory. Um, what, what have I, <clears throat> What have I come to believe about myself because of white supremacy, right? And that may look like hair straighteners, skin bleach. Um, my nose is too big. I wish, you know, I wish I had blue eyes or lighter color eyes. I mean, this is, again, sort of the standard of beauty and normalcy and of preference, right, is for whiteness. And that impacts people of color so deeply, right? So in when I do that inventory and those things come up, 
what I have to remind myself is that Allah makes no mistakes, right? Like this is the, the beauty of Allah's creation is in the diversity, is in how we are just um, able to, to reflect his majesty in those ways, right? And so when I'm ashamed of my color or ashamed of the way that I look, is that in some way a turning away from Allah's beauty and Allah's majesty, right? And so doing the inventory, I think, highlights what we have internalized. And it is, you know, Allah's mercy and compassion that is the antidote to that, right? That we can appreciate all that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created. And when we do not do so, or we think that it has to be altered or that um, there's something wrong with having this amount of melanin, right? It's like, well, who, who am I taking as my God when I do that, right? Am I taking whiteness and white supremacy as my God or the Lord of the worlds? Because the Lord of the worlds tells me, right, that he created us this way. Um, and so I, I want to, there are other sort of things that come to mind, but I, I want to push people because we so often kind of move away from the self-reflection to something that feels like more active, um, so I want to, I want to really want to push in these last 10 days, the, the reflection on what have I come to believe about myself because of the white supremacy that I've internalized and what might I do to turn back to Allah, right? For validation and that who I am is the creation of God. And that is, that is, that does not warrant, right? Um, shame, right? Or, or alteration um, in any way. Definitely. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shai. I really love that that inventory um, that we can do because so many of us maybe uh, our Ramadan is based off of a spreadsheet. And so we like to log different things or you journal it down, but also that, that to keep it in active reflection, um, to, to, th to make this something that we think about at the forefront. Uh, and it's not exclusive from our faith. So, you know, I, 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 the, the applause are kind of coming in. So we definitely really appreciate you thank coming you. into the space. I just dropped in the link for, uh, uh, for Dr. Rashad's uh, Muslim Wellness foundation um and then you probably got to see her handle on twitter she's probably the one reasonable person on twitter um so definitely give her give her a follow uh, inshallah. but um yeah dr rashad thank you so much for for joining our space it was a true thank pleasure uh, and as and for those folks who are in the space who'd like to see this recording later or live streaming uh this will be available on our uh on our youtube page so um oh, stay tuned that. inshallah yeah but thank you so much dr rashad this was a true well, blessing thank you for inviting me Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, everyone, uh, we, we, we're sending our love. It's all, it's all going up there, Dr. Rashad. Thank you again okay. for joining us. Um, for everyone, just next week, we have our final uh, series, the final halakha um, on human dignity, and it will be on environmental justice. It will be oh, on okay. uh, environmental justice with uh, the two authors of the uh, 40 Green Hadith. Um, so you don't want to miss, uh, miss out on that. Uh, we have uh, Sister Sarah Latif and Sister Corey Majid uh, coming to talk about um, uh, environmental justice, dignity, and our Islamic duty to that. But again, Dr. Uh, Rashad, thank you so much for everything. And inshallah, we'll we'll stay in touch. All right. Well, this is this is a lot for us to think on. But the conversation's only beginning. We're just putting a pause on it. Inshallah. Inshallah. Thank you. Assalamualaikum. Waalaikumsalam. Assalamualaikum, everyone.